Be sure to watch News You Can Use on this YouTube channel for updates on news and events here at Grace. We acknowledge that we gather for worship on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe First Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Agreement. We live this by honoring and respecting the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, and ancestors that walked before us their history, spirituality, and culture. We acknowledge the land on which we gather is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Hello, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you for joining us at Grace United Church in Burlington. May you be uplifted and comforted by the Word of God as we worship together. Welcome to this worship for the fourth Sunday in Lent. Today is annual meeting day for folks at Grace starting at 11 a.m. People are asked to find their Zoom link in the Grace line or the e-blast that was sent out earlier this week. In original communications, there were two links listed, so please make sure that you use the one starting with 844. Hope to see you there. As we gather to worship, I invite you to light your candles. When Nicodemus came to Jesus in the darkness of night, Jesus said, The light has come into the world. Those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. May our lights shine brightly as we worship today. Friends, believe this. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are beloved. May God's great love story shine through our worship today. We may come with tiredness, frustrations, or discouragements. We may come with doubts, fears, or longings. We come to worship to discover again how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. Let us come in friendship to God and to each other. Let us worship. God of promise and hope, you call us to trust in your way and set before us paths of faithfulness. Sometimes we hesitate to follow you and to make changes in our lives. Sometimes our priorities and commitments reflect personal interests more than your desire for our lives and your world. We are often impatient and selfish people. When you offer us the promise of a new future, we complain that you don't get there fast enough. When you provide for our needs, we complain that it isn't enough. And when our bad attitudes and negative outlooks cause us to stumble, we blame you. Holy God, 
Forgive our sinful ways. Refresh, renew, and free us, O God. Teach us to be patient. Instruct us to be grateful. Guide us to be responsible and humble. As we turn ourselves around and look to the cross, let us experience your grace and your gift of new life. Bless us for the journey as we continue in prayer. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread that we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, Spare us from the grip of all that is evil. Free us, for you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to show our hearts once more the wondrous nature of God's love. Though we separate ourselves from God and each other by our sins, in great mercy God heals, forgives, and gives us new life. This is the gospel of grace. Believe it, receive it, live it. Well, for our learning time today, I realized we've arrived. We're now at the one-year mark. Our regional council suggested that we acknowledge the anniversary of the pandemic during worship today. And to be honest, at first I thought, who wants to acknowledge that? But then I thought it might be helpful to reflect on some of the positives. Yes, there are people and activities we miss and we long to return to, but we're also doing things at Grace that we'd never have dreamt of under normal circumstances. Virtual worship isn't the same, but people have realized they can be at the cottage in the summer and not miss out. And instead of telling friends about some neat music you've heard, you can just send a link and they can share in the experience with you. And yes, some of you have been enjoying sipping your coffee and sitting in your bunny slippers while worshiping. So there are some perks. Now, while Zoom isn't for everyone, it saved me and others hours of driving to and from meetings. I dumped some PowerPoints in worship before, but learning to make videos is a whole new skill. And I'm sure Larry and Bob never thought video production, recording readers and thinking up creative ideas would land on them. Who knew all that you could do with a cell phone or two? People in the congregation have been more intentional about calling and connecting with people, some you didn't even know before the lockdown started. Folks in the congregation have been great at helping people to get food, to get to appointments, and I doubt we would have started monthly meals without the pandemic, all of which has been kind of a bonus to our life together. We've all had to slow down, and that's not bad. And I believe we now know what's truly important in a very profound way. I don't believe you were ever a congregation that worshipped your building. But while the building does provide a sense of comfort, I believe everyone will agree that it's being together that we've missed the most. In our scriptures today, we'll be hearing about how negative things can be life-giving gifts from God. Yes, there's been limitation, loss, discomfort and anxiety, but there's also been love and care, support, and the prompting to draw our circle wider. So while I don't ever want to repeat 2020, maybe it hasn't been all bad. Our song, no one stands alone. 
Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. A bronze serpent heals the people. From Mount Hor, they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Our reading this morning is taken from John 3, verses 14 to 21. For God so loved the world. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Let us come before God with prayer. Help us, O God, to see you, to understand you, and to hear your voice when you come to us. Keep us curious, keep us reaching out to you, grateful for all those ways that you and love reach out to us. Amen. Hit any TV, radio, Facebook, Twitter, news of any sort, here and around the world, and you're going to find headlines like, Hope Behind the Headlines, COVID-19 Vaccines and Variants. Or, Quebecers born before 1937 to get COVID-19 vaccines next. Or, Booking System Strained but Alberta Starts Vaccinating Seniors. 
Vaccine bookings are also a hot topic of conversation within members of our church family. There's hope that once we have vaccines, we can be physically present with each other once more. And it gives us hope that maybe an end is in sight. Vaccines and the concept of immunization is a wonder of human ingenuity and resourcefulness. The idea is that scientists separate out some materials from the virus cells, parts that won't make us sick. And they put the parts in people and their presence stimulates the creation of germ-fighting cells called antibodies. Now, antibodies recognize the germ cells as bad guys, attach, and when strong enough, they kill the virus cells. So, really, we put a part of what could potentially harm us in perfectly healthy people, so they can build up antibodies to build immunity. So the thing that harms us is used to save us. It's quite amazing when you think about it. The concept is similar to what happens back in the Old Testament story we read in Numbers. For the first 25 chapters, the book recounts incident after incident of the people facing some hardship, throwing their hands up in despair, and pining for the safe days of misery and bondage in Egypt. In today's story, the people are grumbling and complaining that the food is terrible and the water scarce. They've been wandering in the wilderness for a full generation. They've grown impatient, forgetting the hardships of slavery in Egypt, they're starting to think the previous generation was crazy for having left. They're starting to blame their parents, Moses, and God for their predicament. God's finally had enough of all the whining, and God gets a little cranky and sends poisonous snakes. In this instance, God seems to mirror an angry parent, resonating with those infamous words, You want something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. The people were being bitten and were dying. With time, the people have a change of heart. They recognize their sin and rebelliousness, and they ask that the snakes be taken away. At God's bidding, Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. God loved the people so much that God provided an antidote allowing for healing and new life to happen. Now, God didn't remove the snakes, the source of the deadly wounds, but God put the fear of death out in the open where everyone could see it, face it, and move forward with, into full living. You see, fear creates bondage, but love liberates. Fear is not God's thing, but love, never-ending love, love beyond death, that's what God is all about. Nothing paralyzes people faster than fear. Rolf Waldo Emerson said that fear defeats more people than any other one thing in the world. And some have said that fear is a dark room where negatives are developed. It's been suggested that fear can actually serve as an acronym for the choice that we have when we face it. We can either forget everything and run, or we can face everything and rise. God's overriding desire for all of creation is life and light and love. And God's desire for us is not just to exist, but to fully embrace and live life. So face everything and rise is what God is all about with the Israelites. Now let's think about fear for a second. God knew that it's the fears we don't face that become our limitations. The strange truth is that fear does not stop death, it stops life. Bryant Gill suggested fear is a prison where we are our own jailer. At a retreat, I met a wise, sagely woman who said, life always presents us with choices, and it can usually be whittled down to fear versus love. We need to identify which option expresses fear and which embodies love. If we define which choice is fear and which is love, then we know which to choose, because God always chooses love. The legend is told of a desert wanderer who found a crystal spring of unsurpassed freshness. The water was so pure, he decided to bring some as a treasured gift to his king. 
Barely satisfying his own thirst, he filled a leather bottle with the clear liquid and carried it many days beneath the desert sun before he reached the palace. When he finally laid his offering at the feet of his king, the water had become stale and rank due to the old container in which it had been stored. But the king would not let his faithful subject even imagine that it was unfit for use. He tasted it with expressions of gratitude and delight, and sent away the loyal heart filled with gladness. After he'd gone, others sampled it and expressed their surprise that the king had even pretended to enjoy it. Ah, said he, it was not the water that he had tasted, but the love that prompted the offering. I love this story because both men had a choice. The desert wanderer could have lived with fear and hoarded the water for himself, or he might not have shared the gift out of fear of rejection. But instead, in both instances, he chose love. Sharing his treasure and his own generous nature helped him to build up a relationship with the king. But the king also had a choice. Having looked at the old container, he might have feared the contents and refused the gift. But not only did he make the loving choice, he recognized the love that prompted the gift in the first place. It's kind of like when a toddler hands you a bouquet of dandelions. Do you see a fistful of weeds, or do you cherish the glee on the face of the little one who's found something to offer? Today's stories from both the Old Testament and New Testament demonstrate how God calls us to choose love, ironically by forcing us to confront our fears. The Old Testament speaks to our fear of physical death, but what about spiritual death? In the Gospel, we read the second part of Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader. Nicodemus comes in the cover of night to ask Jesus about God. He wants to experience God through Jesus, but he's afraid and uncertain. Nicodemus was pious and religious. He was well-connected and able to say all the right things, but he was not prepared to lay it on the line. He was not prepared to step out into the light. Stalling in the darkness of night, Nicodemus asks Jesus intellectual questions, and when Jesus responds to his questions, Nicodemus comes back with more questions. Jesus appears to lose patience with him. Finally, he states, Nick, it's not about the rules. It's not about knowledge and logic. It's about love. Jesus says to him, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And then Jesus goes on to say what Martin Luther suggests in John 3.16 is the gospel within the gospel. It's the whole Christian story stated succinctly in one sentence. For God so loved the world that God sent us a son that whoever believes in Jesus Christ should not perish but have eternal life. Knowing that people fear death and separation from God, in the same manner as in the Old Testament, Jesus teaches that God loves us enough to provide an antidote in the promise of eternal life. Eternal life doesn't mean you biologically live forever. Eternal life is the promise that in life, in death, in life beyond death, we're never separated from the light of God's love. Jesus implies that our spiritual task is not simply to avoid the shadows, but rather to dispel the shadows by bringing all of life, the good and the bad and the ugly, out into the light. You see, healing involves painful, honest diagnosis, maybe some unpalatable medicine, and sometimes painful physiotherapy or radical surgery. All these activities require bright light and an ability for the physician to see. With light and darkness, we can't live in both simultaneously. We can't avoid choosing. Once there's a sliver of light, darkness is gone. We can't even choose not to choose. It's like when a, a train pulls into the station. You either decide to get on or you don't. Not choosing is a choice. 
James Baldwin suggested that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Facing the shadow aspect of ourselves is not easy, but it's only when pain, burdens, or illness are brought into the light that we can be healed. In the very first act of creation, God separates darkness from light. And when God shines light into the darkness, it's not just to reveal our shortcomings, but to reveal God's infinite grace and love. Love is talked about a lot in the Bible, and surprisingly, more in the Old Testament. And when it appears, it's not human love that's being described, but God's love. And half the time, when the word love appears, it's prefaced by the word steadfast. So the one phrase that gets repeated 42 times in the Old Testament is that God's steadfast love endures forever. Throughout the Old Testament, we're promised repeatedly that God's love will carry on despite hardships. We're promised that God's love will withstand stress or difficulty. God's love will remain with us indefinitely forever, not because of who we are, but because God is who God is, the God of love. And this love is not abstract or vague in concept. St. Augustine, a 4th and 5th century father of the faith, describes God's love this way, God loves each of us as if there was only one of us to love. God loves us in a personal, intimate way, risking with us and calling us to receive God's embrace. The good news is that each of us are loved totally and completely by God. Once upon a time, a farmer printed on his weather vane the words, God is love. Someone asked him if he meant to imply that the love of God was as fickle as the wind. The farmer answered, no. I mean that whichever way the wind blows, God is love. If it blows cold from the north or biting from the east, God is still love, just as much as when the warm south or gentle west winds refresh our fields and flocks. God is always love. We may face times of trial, disappointment, or distress, but God's love remains to embrace us, to sustain us and guide us. God is always love. May we embrace that love freely offered, and may that love give us the strength, the faith, the courage we need to face everything and rise. time of gratitude today, I hold up thanks that we made it through this last year. I give thanks for the challenges met. I give thanks for the new ideas that were tried out. I give thanks for the caring, love, and support extended throughout the congregation. I give thanks for the generosity of heart, past and present, that's carried us through this time. 
Let us open our hearts in thanksgiving as we reflect on the gifts given and received. Let us come before God with prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts that you've given us. Take the gifts we offer and multiply them. Turn them into healing for the sick, food for the hungry, and hope for the despairing. As followers of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And we continue with our prayers of the people. God, we cannot escape your love. We can find no place to hide. You search us out wherever we might be. Your love is like a father's kiss which helps heal a wounded knee or a mother's song healing a frightened heart. Your love shields us from evil. We may travel to the moon or to the depths of the ocean and your love is there. We may think ourselves too sophisticated, but your love is there. We may fall into the pits of sin and your love is there. Thank you, God, for your love towards us, a love so strong that it can reach us in all times and in all places. And so we pray for those who are hurting, in pain, grieving, lost, and alone. May your love be poured out for all, and we pray that they too might know of and feel that love. Today we recognize the whole planet being affected by the pandemic, we continue to hold frontline workers, scientists, healthcare professionals, people fighting COVID, and people grieving those who have died. We also give thanks for the arrival and scheduling of more vaccinations. We pray for all those facing treatments and surgeries. Within and beyond our community, we hold before you Jordan, Liz, and Janet, and we continue to hold Juan, Rosemary, Philip, Sylvia, Don, Andrew, Dave, Suzanne, Rupaya, David, military families in Padawawa and around the country. God of grace, we need you more than ever. Too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down. God, to the suffering of victims and the pain of perpetrators, to the wounds we inflict on others and the wounds we inflict on ourselves. We need to see these things and pray, but we also need our eyes to be lifted, God, to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to the cross that casts its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, so our hearts might be filled with faith and hope and love. We need your presence, your compassion, your comfort, your renewal, your healing, your peace, your joy, your love, your salvation. Loving God, all this was freely given that we might have abundant lives, eternal lives, full lives freed lives, loved lives, loving lives, grace-giving lives. God, as we meet as a congregation to reflect on the year that has passed, maybe we do so with thankful hearts. We give you thanks for those who have served, those who have supported, those who have led, those who have worked and worshipped, those who have received the benefit of our mission and ministry, Bless us as we move from worship into a time of meeting. May we continue to enjoy the blessings we receive and share them generously with others. May we not keep your love a secret, 
but proclaim it to all the world with joy and gratitude. Amen. As we end our time of worship, let us remember that Jesus came to be the light of the world. As we extinguish our candles, let us carry Christ's light in our hearts out into God's world. And as we leave this time, God says repeatedly, look at the cross and live because you are loved. This is God's promise to us today and every day. Let us keep this assurance in our hearts when we suffer and when we sing, when we repent and when we rejoice. Let us go now to be the light for the world. May God our Maker send us back into the world with creative energies refreshed. May Christ the light illuminate our darkest moments. And may the Holy Spirit of steadfast love guide us until we worship together again. Amen. We thank you that your church on sleeping while earth goes onward into life through all the world a watch is keeping and rest not now by day or night so be